And to get things started, I want to introduce Tina. We have um, a nice fruit platter and cheese and crackers, so we, it's, gonna lead, it's all going to lead up to consider the conversation. Where Donna DiMartino, our hospice director, who does a wonderful job, is going to, there's a movie, there's a lot of having that talk and how hard it is to have that talk. And this series that we do, a two-part series, will really, should make you comfortable after sitting down and watching the movie and hearing Donna speak of it. Um, and using some of the tools we have. Yes, and using some of the tools we have to make that happen. But first, we have Suzanne O'Brien. It's today is the first of our three events. She's a registered nurse who has worked with cancer and end-of-life patients for most of her career, yeah. correct? Yes. Based on her experience at the bedside, of dying patients, Suzanne was motivated to write the book, Love, Life, and Transitions, which she, uh, she does have with her today. <coughs> this book helps patients and families have the most empowered end of life experience by really understanding the options that are out there for care and planning. Suzanne is sharing her platform nationwide to help take the fear out of this death experience that no one wants to talk about. Um, and. We are lucky to have her tonight to talk. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, she did a great job of introducing the fact that this is a topic we don't talk about. And as a nurse working with end of life and with also cancer patients for most of my career, it struck me how we don't talk about it, even when somebody is so close to end of life. So I had to do a lot of research and kind of figure out what's going on here in the big picture of things. So I'm going to start with a question for all of you. How many of you here have had a conversation about the end of your lives with your family? Great. How many of you have, have talked about your own death? That's wonderful. It's really an important topic, and it should be one that we do all the time, but we don't. We don't, as conversation don't. So two things that I realized as a nurse working in end of life is that number one, we don't talk about death or dying as a society in general, not even in the medical profession sometimes. It's gotten so backwards. And the second thing that I realized, and this is really important, is that people did not have an understanding of what hospice care really was. They might know the word, they might know it's attached to end of life, but they really didn't understand what it offers. And this, especially when I worked in oncology, was very upsetting for me because there were so many people that could have benefited from this support system at the end, and yet they didn't really know that they could get it or what it stood for. So these are the two platforms that I stand on that I want to educate people on. It's inevitable that all of us are going to experience the end of our lives, the difference is how we choose to experience it. With kindness, with compassion, and with the right support system, end of life can be a positive, natural experience like it was meant to be. So last January, I got an email, and it was saying that the Salisbury, um, that the Scoville Library, the Salisbury Visiting Nurse Association was putting on a series of something called Consider the Conversation. Did anyone get to go to that or hear about it? Great. Well, it was fantastic, and Donna DiMartino was so inspirational and motivated me to want to work with them, their philosophy on hospice care, but more important to me that struck me was their knowledge and their commitment to their community, and this is something that is really something. We have to get healthcare involved in that, and they have that, so we're very lucky to have them right here with us. Now, in February of 2012, I published a book titled Life love and transition. And this book is based on all the experiences that I had at the bedside of end of life patients and their families. There's two things that I discovered there. We have such a fear of death. And I'm not quite sure what happened there and how we got so far into this fear of a natural part of our life's journey but it's really strong and really powerful. And I just think two things happened. I think our medical system, we have made all these great advances. We know how to keep people alive for a very long time, and that's wonderful. People are living into their 80s and 90s, but what's happening is that death is actually becoming so far removed from our natural experience, and some people haven't even seen somebody dying. 
Whereas in the past, people died earlier, they were kept at home, their families cared for them, their neighbors cared for them, and now they haven't. So here we have this amazing fear. And fear is the second leading death in this country. Does anyone know what number one is? Public speaking. <laughs> <laughs> It's right up there. But for me and working with people at end of life and seeing this fear, I'm not saying that it's not scary. How many people are afraid of death here? I'm going to give a little bit of that. Because there's, there's different layers of, of fear. But I will tell you this, that I have been privileged to be with people at the end of their lives and their families. And one thing it has done for me is it made me not afraid of death. Death in and of itself is not scary. So for me to say, what is this big fear that's number two in this country that's making people sort of grab and do everything and sometimes suffering through treatment and not facing something that is a natural part, what are, what are we so afraid of? We're not talking about it. We're not having that conversation. So my poor son who's 19, if I talk about this anymore, he's gonna say stop. But I want him to know that it's, it's part of what we're going to experience, and I want him to know what I want. So there's the two things that happen. We have advanced our medical sustaining life at the same time that we are so afraid. So that's kind of brought us to this place where, wow, we don't talk about this subject, it's very taboo. Well, we're gonna talk about it now. And I wanna tell you that of everything that I've seen, the key is planning ahead. No matter what you choose, if you've talked about end of life with your family, 90% of it is planning ahead. Now, I've developed something called the TAP program. Talk about ahead of time and plan. To make it easy, to try and make it really <coughs> but it's really important. So the first thing is to talk about, to have that conversation. This is really tough. You're going to have to sit down and say to your family, uh, I want you to know I thought about my end of life, and everyone sort of gasps. But I will tell you some great work is done when that happens. Number one. It ensures that you know what I'm afraid of is I'm not afraid of the dying process itself, but I am, I am afraid of losing my dignity. I am afraid of maybe being in pain and having somebody not know that I'm in pain. I don't want to be a burden to my family. And the other thing that I'm afraid of is that while I'm alive, while I'm here today, that I'm not going to tell the people that mean so much to me how much I love them. Talking about this conversation and having it with your family at a dinner table opens up so many wonderful things because first of all, you just said the D word. It wasn't that hard, the death word. It's not closet anymore. Now you can kind of talk about it. And if you talk about what you would want, you can say why you would want that. Now I have already chosen, I've told my son what I would like, and we have this discussion about feeding tubes. I don't know where this 19 year old, 19 year old gets this idea that a feeding tube is great. I mean, he's just kind of, it's so cute, but that's where the education comes in. So it ensures what you would want. You've told your family, but there's something else that happens here. It takes the burden off of them. If somebody gets sick and their wishes aren't known, it falls on the family, and usually it falls on the children. And I'll tell you, I have seen so many scrambling train wrecks because we haven't talked about death ahead of time. All of a sudden it's here. We don't want to see it. The person is, is at the end of life. The fa family's fighting. Some want to have an operation. Some want, don't want to have an operation. And I will tell you that most of the people that I've cared for will kind of take my hand in the bed and we have a moment and say, I don't want any of this. But they're afraid to say that to their family that time because there's too many emotions that go awry. So you talk about it ahead of time. You, you have your family know that they're not going to be making those decisions for you, which takes a big burden off of them because, okay, mom gets sick and gets a terminal diagnosis. Well, here, here's her wishes. It's a no-brainer. It's right on paper. There's no argument here. We don't have to argue. You know what we have to do is love her and take care of her and be present. I always say that the most important thing you can do is what the patient would want, not what you would want. And those are two very different things sometimes. So that's what love is for, for you to follow what the person would want. So now you have that, you have the, fam the family who knows about it. Other things come up. When you have a talk about end of life, when you talk about death, guess what? Some of the other things, well, what is life really about? And how are we spending our time? You'd be amazed at these kind of 
little offshoot conversations that come out and are really therapeutic, or it makes you start to think about your own death, which says, well, what do I want to clean up? Or what conversations do I want to have, God forbid? Because I will tell you that we don't have any guarantees in life. You know, it was interesting that we're working with people that have a terminal diagnosis, yet we know that people, unfortunately, have accidents and they can die at any time. So it's really important just to live your life and to be aware of, of the gift that we have during the day. Now, the tap the A ahead of time. The key to having this conversation is ahead of time before anyone gets sick. Does anyone have an opinion why that's important to do it ahead of time? Too many times I've seen that when somebody gets that diagnosis, like I said, there is a shock mode. There is people going into a crisis mode. It's very emotional. Now, if you couple that with we haven't talked about death, all of a sudden, mom's getting a terminal diagnosis. How can I make a clear decision about care or about wishes? And this is what's really unfortunate. I've seen so many people miss the opportunity to be present with their loved one, have a conversation that's really present because of all the dysfunction that was attached to death that all of a sudden is right in the room with them. So there's a, there's a really good reason to have this talk ahead of time. I have a story about a woman named Joy. She is a friend of mine and she does work, but of course everyone I, I kind of connect with does some offshoot of what we're trying to do here. So she said, I'm going to have my three adult children over this weekend and I am going to talk to them about my wishes, my paperwork, where it is, and make sure that everyone can ask questions. Well, apparently it went so well that you know they had um, people going around at the end saying if they wanted to be buried, if they wanted to be cremated, they had a lot of laughs with it. But I think when you have the elephant in the room and you talk about it, guess what? All of a sudden it's not so scary. And there's also a relief <clears throat> part of it that goes with, gosh, I know what she wants. I don't have to worry about you know making decisions for her. So there is another story that I want to tell you about a woman named Madeline. And she was one of my hospice patients. She's 81 years old. And she came on the program and she knew right away when she got a diagnosis of she had rectal cancer. And the reason that I'm giving you what she had is because it's really important for you to make informed decisions about your care. It's really important for you to know if you have an illness, what that illness is, and what is the natural progression of it or <coughs> natural treatment. Um, they vary, some of them vary a lot. This woman came on the program, she lived in Millbrook, she was absolutely lovely, 81 years old, she knew right away, I wanna go home. I would want, she had three rescue dogs, she had a bunch of cats, but she was the matriarch of this family. And there were people in and out, there was so much love in this household. Did we have to manage her symptoms closely? Absolutely. Uh, she had pain issues, she had some nausea issues, but when you can manage those, and you can, people say that end of life, you can't do anything. And sometimes the doctors say, well, I can't cure you, so I can't do anything. There is symptom management. There is being there for that patient. It's scary when you're sick, but the one thing the doctor can do too is take care of the spouse and the other people in the family that need a lot of care, and that's another reason that End of Life and Hospice is such a wonderful organization, because they take care of the patient and the patient's loved ones equally. That's huge. So Madeline came home, we had probably about two months with her, wonderful people in and out. And I will tell you that I got to be there at the end. We're, we're very close when we take care of people at home. And especially if there's a transition going on, we're right on top of that and the phone is, is you know, one call away we're there. Well, I came on this fall day and it was one of those absolutely gorgeous days like we had this weekend. I remember going outside and calling the doctor, I was gonna get another order and her niece came out and said, it's time. And so I went inside, and, and it was time, and it was interesting that somebody knew that, because sometimes you, I have to be the one to tell them, which is fine. But she had her sister, her nieces, and a granddaughter there, and they surrounded the bed, and they were all holding hands, and she quietly was just taking her last, it was the most beautiful passing that I've ever seen. And that's one of the things, she wanted it that way, she wanted to be home, Everyone knew it, so there was sort of that issue was already gone, and they could be present. There was so much love in those last weeks, and I think great storytelling. And it just, the end of it just capitalized on all of that. It was, it was quite beautiful. P, the tap, the plan. Okay, 
so here's where I really was shocked that people did not understand what hospice was. Now, I will tell you, doing the research, it's only been around about 30 years in, so I always say, well, we've been dying for so long, what have we been doing ahead of that? It's, it's kind of upsetting that it's only been around for 30 years and still people didn't have an idea what hospice meant. What do they offer? Is it giving up? Is it, does it mean if I go on hospice, I'm going to die? I want to tell you that there were so many times in the hospital that were heartbreaking to be at the bedside of patients that were holding on and their families were holding on with one more operation with maybe trying a different chemotherapy, and I'm not saying to not do this. That's not what I'm saying at all. But it wasn't going to reverse the process. And I do want to tell you that, I don't know, does, has anyone recovered from a surgery? It takes a lot. So if you take somebody who is already advanced in age, you can't just say, this is what we have, this is the surgery. I think it has to, it has to be looked at the whole person. We're not treating a disease, we're treating a person and we're treating them holistically, mind, body, and spirit. They're all there, and they want to be acknowledged. So I've seen too many times that it's ended, not in a great way, and people love their loved ones, and they're gonna remember those last weeks for a very long time. So not only do we want everything great for the patient, but we absolutely want the families to have a positive end-of-life experience as well. So let's talk about hospice. Can anyone tell me that doesn't work for hospice? <laughs> Can anyone tell me what the criteria time-wise? If, yes. Was it six months? Correct. So if your doctor says that yes, you know what you have, if it follows its regular path, and believe me, there's exceptions to all rules, <clears throat> if it follows the regular path, that you have about a life expectancy of six months. But I will tell you that I have seen better work done in the last six months of life than sometimes in the last 30 years. And, and I will tell you why. Because everyone does this, they stop. They put their cell phone down, they stop. And they're present with their loved ones because they know that their time is limited. And I see such beautiful work done and I see conversations. And here's the thing, if you're home and your symptoms are managed, well, there's a lot of great things you can do and you can go for more than six months. It doesn't always follow that suit. But the beautiful thing is that the work that everyone got to be together and how many people would like to be kept at home if they were terminally ill? Or in one of you, in somewhere like that. I would, I would too. And it's nine out of 10 people polled want to be kept at home yet half are dying in the hospital. So again, I wanted to go back and say, well, nine out of 10 and my little patients are saying this to me, I, I don't want to be here. Why are, why are we not doing that? So we had to start in the beginning, we have to talk about it. Let's, I want to support the doctors for a minute. I think the medical profession is really challenging at this time, and that's saying it nicely. Doctors don't have a lot of time, and the medical schools can train you to keep people alive, and it's fantastic. You do this, you can keep the person alive, but they haven't really been trained in end of life, and they, sometimes think that end of life is a failure. And it's not a failure. And sometimes they feel bad and they don't want to face it. I know that I've had some of these experiences. It's okay, we have to all do this together. We have to all, but it, you know what? It's gotta start with all of us saying, well, I'm, if anyone knows any differently that we're not gonna get there, but we are gonna get there, so why don't we do it our way? And why don't we put it in writing? And why don't we talk to our families about it and even talk to our doctors about it? Now, again about hospice, I just want to, because I want to make the things that I found that weren't clear really clear. You talk great about the time-wise. Um, hospice has a team of workers that is an interdisciplinary team, which means that you get a nurse, but you get a home health aide, you get a social worker, and you get spiritual care. And I'm sure you have other, we had some music therapy, and they have, but this holistic interdisciplinary team of kind of coming in and supporting not only you, but your family is dynamic. It's wonderful. We should have it for everybody. So again, it was upsetting to see that people didn't know that they had this option. One really funny thing or fun thing that happened is sometimes people go home and guess what? They perk up. The doctor thinks they don't have a lot of time. They go home. 
they're in their surroundings, their family comes, again, their family is present with them, and they think this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, and I don't blame them. Your symptoms are managed. Say you have nausea. I don't know how many people have experienced nausea, but I'll tell you something, that rivals pain. That is a really bad feeling. And if you can control it, which we can, you can start eating again. You can get up. You can do things. You're at home. So it's a great opportunity to have. Um, what's the other thing about hospice that we want to say? I know that you probably want to add in. I just want them to know the criteria. Who can refer somebody to hospice? Does it need to be a doctor? Anybody. Anybody can make that referral. If you thought that your neighbor, if you thought that your loved one, you can pick up the phone and call your local hospice and say, I think that we might have someone here that fits the criteria, and they'll come out and they'll assess that patient. And then they will talk to the doctor and get the doctor on board. Um, but it's important to know that anyone can refer because I have had opportunities to be with people and the doctor, I love them very much, but they keep going forward and forward and forward. And sometimes you have to say, okay, it's all right that we're where we are. So the one thing that you can do is have an advanced directive. Does anyone have that in the room already? Okay. Does anyone want to explain what it is in layman terms? Would you like to? You don't have to. Yeah. But it's a, it's a legal document, it's in a paper and, that's stating... And she went into in detail and sure. so previously we've been designated um, places to, places you don't want to be. Perfect, stay with that right now. It's so important that the paper says what you might want, but more importantly what you don't want. And there can be a lot of that, so, so that's great to have. And you need to know, you need to know where those are. Because if something does happen and we're not feeling well, you don't want it locked in a safe somewhere. You do want to have several copies that your, your children have. And they can be changed at any time, too. They're not set. People sometimes worry about putting it down in writing. Um, I have a story about two men who are 80 years old. Well, they were 80 years old. And they were both diagnosed with lung cancer within a month of each other. One was in New York. He was a psychologist. One was in Boston. He was a very big businessman. Both very intelligent, great men. They both decided to take different roads of their pathway. Robert, who was in Boston, went into, he had all those medical centers up there, they had the, the latest information on everything. He went into treatment right away. Boom, that's your diagnosis, went into treatment that week. Lee, the psychologist from New York, said to himself, okay, I'm 80 years old, and if this is what it is, this is what it is. And he decided that he wanted to go home on hospice care loved his garden, he was very attached, and he had a beautiful wife at home. So that's the different pathways that started out. Now Robert, a few weeks into his treatment, and remember, he's got all the latest information up there, they found out that that chemo wasn't working, and they switched him to another one. I had been privileged to know the families of actually both of these gentlemen, and I had seen Robert at some functions up in Boston, and he wasn't doing well at all. He was very, very sick throughout that year. Um, again, I'm not telling you at all what to choose, I'm just showing you the two different pathways. He missed out on a lot of family opportunities, and I think when he did go to them, he did not feel well. Now Lee was doing his gardening. He was, up until the last week, they said he was getting out of bed and still making jokes. Robert died about a year after his diagnosis, and Lee was still with us. He was with us for about another two and a half months. And like I said, he was out of bed that last week, hospice nurse would come in, he would do his gardening, and he would make his, his jokes that I don't were very funny. The clock, I want you to think about the quality of your time. And one of the things that I try and teach is that talking about this is not just for the end of our lives. Talking about it focuses on our lives right now. So it's really important to know your options. It's really important for you to decide for yourself what you would want. And don't leave it up to your kids, and believe me, if you do not have those decisions made and you start to go into the hospital kind of treadmill, it's very hard to sort of come back from that. It can be, it can be a cycle, so I don't want you to get caught in that. It's inevitable that each one of us here is going to face the end of our lives. We wouldn't bring a baby into this world without planning and preparing. Well, the same should be done for when we leave, with kindness and compassion. End of life can be a positive, natural experience that we spend together. Now, we have a question and answer, and you can ask anything, even if you think it's not relevant. Things come up for people, and I want them to be able to ask anything they want. Can I just do one thing? And you can. Come on I want to just do one thing. I want to
invited Donna to please talk for a few minutes about our specific hospice program at Salisbury and um, the great things that she does at our agency, Smith Hospice. They would physically take a step away from me. <laughs> like I have something to do. So I've changed my language and I now tell people what it is I do. And so someone says to me, What do you do? And I say, Well, I'm part of a program. And they say, Really? What kind of a program? I say, Well, it's a, it's a program of a visiting nurse agency. Oh, well, what, what does that program do? Well, we provide nursing services to people who are really facing. We provide a social worker to help the patient and the family as they have to make difficult decisions and they walk difficult paths. We provide home health aids that can help you when you're having trouble getting in the shower, taking a bath. Really? They start to say, yeah. Oh, and we also have uh, spiritual people who come to your house. It doesn't matter what your religion. It doesn't even matter if you don't believe in it. <coughs> What gives meaning to your life? What's important to you? What are, what are the things that are most important to you? And, oh yeah, I also have volunteers that can come in. And they can stay with you if you're sick. Or perhaps you'd like your wife to have a break and have somebody else do the grocery shopping for you this week. We can take care of that. We can do all those things. And if this illness doesn't work out the way you may want, if indeed you die, you know what? We're going to still be there to look after your loved one. So then people say to me, wow, what is that program? And then I say, well, that's hospice. So you see, that's the essence of it. And I think that we need to do exactly as you're saying. Not talk about the word, because it's, it's connected with lots of bad things. The reality is, as many of you have heard me say, I have friends who work in Europe. They think that America is the only place that death is optional. <laughs> because we make it optional. We always have another treatment. We always have something more we can do. And sometimes the doctor will unfortunately say to you, oh, I'm really sorry, there's nothing more we can do. And that's when I want to scream and jump up and down and say, oh, you're so wrong. Right. We can do a lot. We can help you live better. We can help improve the quality of your life. We can help your loved ones. We can help your family. We can help you face this path. We know how to do this. We're trained to do this. We spend a lot of time learning how to do this. And we do it because we love people. That's really why we do it. It's sort of, to me, the best place to be. When I was a young nurse, I was delivering babies. So now I'm at the other end of my life. <laughs> and you know what? This is where I want to be. Because I realize the inevitability of it. I also realize that it doesn't have to be for Amy, and there there can be a lot of support when you go to work with them. So yeah, that's really the basics. That you know, we're there to help. We're there to help when you think, oh my God, what am I going to do? Well, call. We'll help. That's what we do. So if you have questions, that's the way. optional and that's kind of what it seems it seems like you know you have a choice but it's not so I've you know studying what has made yeah. a positive experience for somebody what are the elements that's what I've been studying for over 10 years and it all comes down to planning ahead talking about it ahead and having that support system which is fantastic who knows the ending of Art Buckwald and his hospice <laughs> this is such a good story in fact you kind of reminded me of that the other day so he was this great humorous columnist, and at 81, he, he's told he has kidney failure, which is usually very serious, and within a short amount of time, he will be gone. So he goes to a hospice house, and he doesn't die. And he's having a great old time. He's being supported, he has all these people coming in, I think it was over two years. Hospice National Association made him man of the year, 